going back to this, this journey into retail, uh, so we have this uh, showroom in our office that is on track to do like $2 million of sales out of uh, this sort of non-retail building of the fifth floor. Uh, the landlord keeps calling us saying that we have too much traffic in the elevator. Finally, the straw that breaks the camel's back is that we had 18 MIT students coming to visit uh, our office. And they decided that it was a good idea to all pack into the elevator at once. <laughs> the elevator went down. We had to call the fire department. Landlord completely gives us the boot. And uh, needless to say, we don't recruit at, at MIT. Um, <laughs> but uh, with sort of the success uh, of our office store, we then started doing concept stores. So our first concept store was on uh, Grand Street off of West Broadway in a 4,500 square foot uh, garage that had never been used for retail before. We called it the Warby Parker Holiday Spectacle Bazaar. Uh, we sold Christmas trees out of it, which uh, we quickly learned um, you're actually not allowed to have live Christmas trees in in a retail or public place. You can have them in a private residence, but there was this new code that was passed. So it's literally the second day that we're open and suddenly we hear uh, a, a, a fire truck coming and we're like, oh, what's wrong? And sort of a, a, a whole ladder company sort of parks right in front of our store and, and two other fire trucks close down all of Grand Street, um, you know, sirens blasting, the lights going. Um, and they literally force us to drag out all of these like 12 foot Christmas trees. Um, so lessons and scars of retail. Um, so now we know only fake trees. Uh, but uh, what we try to do is create an experience. Um, and, and we think more and more that uh, retail is all about uh, uh, entertainment. Um, and there's this sort of dichotomy that's happening between and this has always been the case, but I think it's becoming more severe with e-commerce. E um, and, and that's, uh, you know, you have your categories like paper towels and toilet paper, which, you know, soon you will never buy out of a bricks and mortar store, right? Which they'll just magically show up at your apartment. They already do. I don't know, has anybody tried those Amazon Now buttons? Um, so Amazon Now, you can uh, buy a button for certain products uh, like paper towels um, or garbage bags. Uh, we have one under our sink and uh, Griffin keeps pressing it um, so we have enough garbage bags for the next two years. Um, but we see that happening on, on one uh, end of the retail spectrum and then uh, th this other end um, where right in a sea of incredible choices and uh, fierce price competition, then what is it really, um, it, it, it's about um, experiences and how can we create a holistic, incredible experience from the moment you hear about the brand to your decision to purchase, to that shopping experience, to that transaction, to the anticipation of the product to arrive, to opening that packaging uh, and using the product on an ongoing basis. Um, and this was our first foray into that. We invited partners to also sell products out of this large space. One was Best Made Axes, which um, actually makes the best axes. Uh, and they actually sold out in about 48 hours, which terrifies me because I don't understand why so many people in New York City need uh, a an axe. But um, this, you, we ended up having all of these learnings, even from like the amount of lighting that's required to sell glasses to the fact that full length mirrors are, are more um, customer friendly than just head mirrors that we would often use when we were uh, buying for glasses before Warby Parker. And that's led to us uh, signing long-term leases. Our uh, first store was on Green Street between Prince and Houston. It, it's uh, there today uh, next to Ralph Lauren across from the Apple store on a sales per square foot basis. Um, we're on par with some of the best retailers today, actually ahead of Lululemon, Michael Kors, par with Tiffany's. Um, the only person that's performing better is Apple, um, but they're an outlier within the, the retail industry. Um, and you'll see that there are moments in here that actually remind you of a library, and that goes back to that heritage of uh, 
these Kerouac characters that we discovered in the New York Public Library. So we have rolling ladders uh, from the Putnam La Ladder Company that was formed in 1901. Uh, we sell books. Actually, we work with 14 independent publishers. Um, those are sort of the, the, the bottom base under the glasses. Uh, and part of that was actually some of the learnings from the Holiday Spectacle Bazaar, where it's, hey, people don't want to bend down too far to pick up a, a pair of glasses, so we had this extra space. Um, and it made sense to continue to tell that, that brand story. Um, we uh, then bought an old yellow school bus, um, which are surprisingly inexpensive. Uh, most states actually uh, require that uh, a lot of these uh, buses be decommissioned, so you can get a, a bus, I think it costs us like $10,000. Ripped out the interior, had a person that does the interiors of yachts and high-end motor coaches help us install beautiful oak shelves. Went to 15 cities over about a year and a half. In each city, we'd go to two or three different neighborhoods. Um, and we could t I could tell you exactly what are the intersections uh, where Warby Parker performs best. Uh, it was actually the best was on Emmon, Wisconsin in Georgetown. And sure enough, we're opening a store there later this year. Um, but um, this is just another example of how you know you can continue to use sort of testing and iteration and, and prototyping even at a larger scale. Um, I'm going to go into questions uh, pretty soon so please start thinking about questions uh, but uh, another example of a store is uh, on 82nd and, and Lexington this was the old Laskov's pharmacy that had been there uh, for 90 years. Um, they had also been uh, 90 years ago they were uh, across the street for about 20 years before that and were really instrumental on uh, actually creating the first regulations around prescription drugs uh, in New York State that ended up, a lot of those uh, ended up getting, uh, sort of inspiring a lot of the federal legislation. But um, this was just a really special space um, that we were able to maintain a bunch of its integrity. And Laskov's, by the way, went out of business two years before we signed the lease. So that was important important that everybody in the neighborhood knew that. Um, but just how can, when somebody walks in, that they just have uh, a smile on their face and uh, sort of this wow moment? And are there actually Instagrammable moments uh, that we can create throughout the store, whether it's hiring Myra Kelman to do um, so, some paintings uh, in the space, um, or even uh, designing our own cathedral windows. And you might see some W's there uh, uh, for Warby Parker. So just how can we create really special moments? Uh, this is our store on Abbot Kinney in Venice uh, in LA. Um, and we worked with an LA-based artist, Jeff McFetrich, to create a mural on an otherwise hideous building. Uh, we were able to make uh, sort of this statement that was also uh, provide some art for the community. Um, and if you look, it's actually a person looking up wearing a pair of glasses. Um, a lot of people think it's like a shark or a wave, um, which, I, which I can definitely see. Um, this is uh, uh, our store in Buckhead. Um, and so sort of we, we've now been able to refine a lot of the finishings, a bunch, and, and I'd like to show this just because this is uh, a part uh, of that iteration. And in particular, in that back area, we have a reference desk, which is an ode to libraries. Um, but it's sort of our equivalent of the Apple Genius Bar, where you can go there, get adjustments for your glasses, um, ask any questions that you may have. Um, and um, you know, again, I'll, I'll stop in, in a moment. But just was going to point out, uh, a few examples of experiences that we've tried to create, again, to uh, sort of really elevate and, and explain what this brand is to uh, our employees and, and, and to the general public. So our very first fashion presentation on the left here was at the New York Public Library. Right? Most people do uh, fashion shows at Lincoln Center um, or fashion presentations at Milk Studios. Uh, we decided that sort of the day before Fashion Week, so that way we weren't competing with everybody, to do uh, sort of this guerrilla show um, where we had a bunch of staff um, go sit in the great reading room um, and take up a bunch of, uh, of tables. And then we did hair and makeup for about 20 25 different models at the Bryant Park Hotel and then snuck them in uh, to the library one by one. And the security guards 
were really confused because uh, they didn't understand why there were so many sort of beautiful people uh, wandering, wandering in there. And I was so worried that right, we were going to get kicked out. Um, but the only thing they really cared about was the fact that we were using uh, flash photography. So I got yelled at a few times. But we had sent an invitation to uh, a bunch of uh, uh, writers and, and editors um, that on thick card stock that said, shh, come and meet us um, in front of the big buildings with the lions in front of it on 42nd and 5th Avenue. And we were deliberate. We didn't want to use the New York Public Library's name because at the time we didn't have permission to, to do this. Um, and we created a, a vellum sheet with a reading list on it and a New York Public Library card. And all of these uh, writers uh, and, and editors, uh, fashion writers and editors, met us in front uh, of the library. We walked them in, and then at 3.30 on the dot, all of the models put on their Warby Parker glasses and lifted up these books with this Warby Parker blue with the frame name by Warby Parker, and it created this amazing visual and this amazing uh, experience that uh, pretty much every writer and editor that attended ended up writing about it the next day. And because it was the day before Fashion Week, we sort of uh, got a disproportionate uh, um, amount of press and um, it sort of leads me to sort of why um, we uh, we sort of do what we do and and what are sort of the brand filters that we look through when deciding what to do and we always ask ourselves a few questions um, you know is this authentic to Warby Parker is there a compelling narrative around it is it unexpected right is this something that people are going to want to talk about right because everybody wants to sound smart at the dinner table you know can they sound smart talking about something that that Warby Parker did um, and then of course lastly um, does it do good in the world and I think um, when when we think why Warby Parker has been successful and has grown to over 500 people in five years over 12 stores we're opening another eight later this year distributing over a million pairs of glasses to people in need um, that's really because of having a compelling narrative having this stakeholder decision uh, making approach uh, this hierarchy of communications and uh, knowing what to lead with and and what to follow on with um, just having fun um, and, and embracing sort of our, our inner quirks. And lastly, just the, the goodwill uh, uh, of friends, uh, of classmates in, in particular, um, and, and all of our former employers that just were incredibly supportive early on. Uh, so that with that, uh, just uh, thank you. Um, and if anybody uh, has any questions, uh, we'll help you answer them. Thank you.